This is the Dean, the Dean Show. This is the Dean Show. This is the Dean, this is the Dean Show. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, assalamu alaikum, peace be with you. I'm your host, you are watching The Dean Show. Thank you for coming back for another great episode. We got Dr. Lawrence Brown, it's exciting, exciting. He's back with us again. We had to get someone who is well-versed in Christianity to talk about the next topic. We don't want to offend nobody. We really want the best for our brothers in humanity. Some people are confused and we want to clear the confusion. And now Dr. Brown, who was an atheist, you can go to thedeanshow.com. He has his own private section there to hear his story. He was an atheist. He was trying very hard to be a Christian. The whole doctrine of the Trinity and many of the other tenets uh, of Christianity didn't make sense, and he ended up coming to Islam. Islam, the same way of life of Jesus, Moses, Abraham, Noah, that complete and total adherence to God's laws, that complete submission and surrender to the one God alone and not his creation. So when we come back, we're going to be clearing up the confusion about the Trinity. The Trinity is going to be giving us the top 10 reasons why the Trinity is not valid. When we come back here on The Dean Show, don't go nowhere. This is The Dean, The Dean Show. This is The Dean Show. This is The Dean Show. This is The Dean Show. Assalamu alaikum, peace be with you. Wa alaikum assalam How are you? How are you, Dr. Brown? Yeah, alhamdulillah. All praise be to Allah. It's, it's a pleasure to have you back with us here at the Dean Show. And I got to just describe a little bit uh, about our, our past. We have your conversion story. We've done some shows with you in the past. And you have at thedeanshow.com your own private section so people can read a little bit more about you. Get to know who you are, watch some of your other videos. But in this week's show, we're going to be talking about the Trinity. You have a DD, Doctor in Divinity, PhD in Religious Studies, and you're very well versed. Some will consider you a Christian scholar. So we want to talk to the experts, and there's some, a lot of confusion about this Trinity. So we know that the Quran says that this is something that Jesus or none of the messengers never taught. The consistent message that God has always declared throughout time that He is only one, undividable, not three and one, one and three, just one. And we believe Jesus taught the same teaching, but there's some confusion about the Trinity. So you're going to be giving us today the top ten reasons why the Trinity is not valid. I don't want to waste their time, your time. Let's just get right to it. The top ten, please begin. Okay. Uh, number ten, because the word Trinity is nowhere to be found in the Bible. Now, the word Trinity is not as important as finding the actual doctrine. So, number nine. So you just jump. You just, it's done. Yeah, look. Ten is done. We're not wasting no done. time. Ten is oh. done. All right, let's take it to, no, let's take it okay. to no, number nine. Ten is done. You don't find the word Trinity anywhere it's in finished. the Bible. That was simple. That was easy. Okay. okay. But as I said, the word is not as important as the doctrine. So the question is, do we find the doctrine in the Bible? We go on to nine then. Number nine. Harper Collins, Encyclopedia of the Bible, states, quote, the doctrine of the Trinity as such is not revealed in either the Old Testament or the New Testament. HarperCollins Encyclopedia of the Bible telling us what? Telling us, I'll say it again, quote, the doctrine of the Trinity as such is not revealed in either the Old Testament or the New Testament. You know, we almost don't need to do the rest of this program because that pretty much says it right there. But let's continue. So we, we're moving on to eight now? We're, we're going to move quickly. This is eight. We're so going can to eight. We, we get a duff roll or the drum roll? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The duff. Let's go. Number eight. We'll, we'll, we'll just keep moving through these. The, the point then is, well, if the doctrine is not revealed in the Bible, where did it come from? Uh, the doctrine of the Trinity started with Tertullian in 220 CE. What does that tell us? That tells us that the, the doctrine of the Trinity was dreamed up by Tertullian. Who was Tertullian? He was a lawyer in Carthage. 
around 200 years after the mission of Jesus Christ. So this was not a doctrine that was written into the Bible. This was a doctrine that was derived by a lawyer, and we all know how much we trust lawyers. <laughs> Sorry, but I, I got to throw that one in because I'd love to see what was in his fine print, but the bottom line is 200 years after the mission of Jesus Christ, that is when Tertullian came up with the concept of the Trinity. Take it to step number seven. So we already went from 10, 9, ten, nine eight, 8, 7. Take it away, Dr. Lawrence Brown. 7. Where did it go from there? Tertullian came up with the concept in the year 220 CE. Where did it go from there? Talk to Christian scholars. They will tell you the Trinity is an evolved doctrine, meaning that it was not a revealed doctrine. It was a doctrine that evolved in the minds of the theologians who developed it. Council of Nicaea in 325 developed it further. Council of Constantinople in 381 ratified it, and it became authoritative at the Council of Chalcedon in 451. Very so what are we saying? We're saying over 400 years after the time of Jesus Christ was How many years? Over 400. 400 years Council until... Council of Chalcedon was in 451. So what are we saying? We're saying that over 400 years after the time of Jesus Christ, this is when the, the doctrine of the Trinity became authoritative at the Council of Chalcedon. That leads us to number six. So you're talking about now we went from 10, we're moving on to six, and all these things. This is not something that came with the first man, Adam, or the prophet Moses, Noah. This is evolving. You're taking about 400 years after Jesus left the scene. This didn't come with any of the prophets. This came from the mind of a lawyer over 200 years after the mission of Jesus Christ. It evolved over another 200 years after that. It was ratified into the Christian canon at the Council oh. of Chalcedon in 451, or excuse me, actually ratified at the Council of Constantinople in 381 and then became authoritative okay. at the Council of Chalcedon. All right, so we're moving on to, oh, to, to number what now? This is number... Number six. Number six. Number take, six. Take it away, please. Everybody knows Hans Kung, the leading uh, theologian of the Roman Catholic Church, and, and uh, he, in commenting talking about throughout the New Testament, quote, there is no doctrine of one God in three persons, quote, modes of being, no doctrine of a triune God, a trinity. These are the words of Hans Kung, okay? If we don't trust him with regard to Catholic or Christian doctrine, I don't know who we can trust because he is one of the most authoritative voices on on. Catholic and, and Christian doctrine. You want to hear it again? It goes yeah. like this. There is no doctrine of one God in three persons, modes of being, no doctrine of a triune God, a trinity. And is he's he, talking about inside the New Testament. Mind, I mean, it's mind-boggling, the trinity, but this is mind-blowing that you're making it so easy to understand, and all we ask is that the people out there, they have an open heart and open mind, and this, you know, the truth shall set you free. Can we move on to number five? Number five. Take it away. Harper's Bible Dictionary. Harper's Bible Dictionary says, quote, the formal doctrine of the Trinity. The formal doctrine of the Trinity, as it was defined by the great church councils of the fourth and fifth centuries, is not to be found in the New Testament. Not to be found. Not to be found. The formal doctrine of the Trinity, as it was defined by the great church councils of the fourth and fifth centuries, is not to be found in the New Testament. And that's number five. That's Harper's Bible Dictionary. Wasn't with the first man, Adam, with none of the prophets, and after the, Jesus left the scene 400 years later, you mentioned some attorney. Now, we know how attorneys work. <laughs> Tertullian. But, yeah, we're yeah. going to take a break, and we're going to come back for number four of the top ten reasons why the Trinity was never the teachings of any of the prophets, and it's not valid. We'll be right back. I don't say to people I used to be a Christian. I still carry the values and the principles of loving Jesus Christ and perhaps maybe more than the people who call themselves Christians. So I think I got the best out of Christianity by becoming Muslim. So many other things that you can enjoy without drinking a sip of alcohol. This is the same thing. It's not an obstacle. It's not something to cause people to get completely desperate and start stopping living their lives. No, it should be a motivation. It's only one life that you're going to be living, so you better do it for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I am not afraid to stand alone. I am not.
not afraid to stand alone If a lies by my side I am not afraid to stand alone I am not afraid to stand alone If a lies by my side I am not afraid to stand alone I am not afraid to stand alone If a lies by my side I am not afraid to stand alone Back here on The Dean Show, we don't want to waste your time, we don't want to waste nobody's time. We're giving the facts, not the fiction, and let's continue on with number four of the top ten reasons why Jesus, peace be upon him, never taught the Trinity, and this Trinity is not valid. Talk to us. Okay. We just talked from Harper's Bible Dictionary. Let's go to number four, an even more authoritative source, the New Catholic Encyclopedia. Quote, the formula itself does not reflect the immediate consciousness of the period of origins. What does that mean? We're talking about the periods of, period of origins, in other words, during the time of the mission of Jesus Christ and the recording of the manuscripts that, that formed the foundation of the Bible. And the New Catholic Encyclopedia says, quote, the formula itself, referring to the Trinity, does not reflect, does not reflect, the immediate consciousness of the period of origins. Now, you can, you can even read further. Elsewhere in the New Catholic Encyclopedia, it states, quote, among the apostolic fathers, there had been nothing even remotely approaching such a mentality or perspective. Nothing. That's a very strong statement for a Catholic reference work to, to make, that among the apostolic fathers, Okay, the ones from which the, the religion you know, was passed on to, to future generations. Among the apostolic fathers, there had been nothing even remotely approaching such a mentality or perspective. That's number four. The New Catholic Encyclopedia refuting the Christian doctrine, the Catholic doctrine of the Trinity. We're moving on to number three. I'm going to dig into you, and I'm going to ask you some very serious questions, but I want to get through these so we don't waste no more time. Let's go into... Number three. Number three. The first commandment. First commandment, not to place any partners beside God. That God is one God. And that jumps to number two. You oh, want to go we, quickly? We, we just went from three. We're going to number two. Wasting no time with Dr. Yep. Lawrence Brown. Let's go to number two. Why does it jump to number two? Because number two is the words of Jesus Christ. Three places in the Bible. Jesus Christ is quoted as having said, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. He doesn't, he doesn't add any modification. He doesn't add any explanation. If ever there were a place to explain the Trinity, that would have been it. If you ask any Christian to explain the essence of God, they'll say, well, God is one, but he's three, he's three and one, and, da, 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 and they will try to explain. If they explain it that way, why didn't Jesus Christ? Why did Jesus Christ say, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, period. Full stop, nothing more. Because there is nothing more. Nothing more. If, if, he had, if he had wanted to explain, that would have been the perfect spot. He didn't say it once, he said it three times, or at least it's recorded three times. Mark 12, 29, Matthew 22, 37, and Luke 10, 27. Look them up you'll find that he's not only saying this, but he's saying that is the greatest commandment. So that's number two. Now, before we go to number one, people are just going to have to wait. I, I want to ask you, now, you went from being an atheist. You didn't, that means you didn't believe in God. Right. And you said you were trying very, very hard to be a Christian. Now, is it because of this and these things, this confusion here, that you weren't able to truly be a Christian? Yeah. And, you know, I think, I think a lot of people out there understand because a lot of people, they want to believe. They believe, they have a core belief. They believe in God. They believe in the chain of prophethood. They believe that there were books of revelation. But they identify, and they identify the same thing that we are talking about here. They identify inconsistencies. They identify contradictions. They identify division between what the scripture says and what the church says about the scripture. They recognize inconsistency between what Jesus Christ said about himself and what other people say about Jesus Christ. They, they recognize that we are, you know, we are defining 
in Islam, we, we are defining the problems in the Christian canon where that contradicts the Christian scripture. Just hold up. We're going to get to number one. Just, just hold on one second. But if someone says, you know, he didn't have the Holy Ghost in him. He wasn't full of the Spirit. Is that what was he missing? Who? You. Me. <laughs> like me. You're, say, yeah. you're saying, okay, I can't understand because I don't have the Holy Spirit inside yeah. me. What do you got to say about this? You know, I mean, how, how can you fight an argument like that? I, I mean, it, to, to me, it is such a nonsensical argument. Why is it nonsensical? Because you have all of these people walking around claiming to have the Holy Spirit inside them. Who told them that they have the Holy Spirit inside them? A man. Somebody in their congregation, a priest, a pastor, a minister or whatever, has told them, you have the Holy Spirit inside you. Okay, but why do you trust this man for telling you that? You know, is he a prophet? Is is he, does he have some special connection to God that allows him to tell people that they have the Holy Spirit inside them? You know, take the evidence I present and you weigh it for yourself. It's not going to, you know, it, it's not for me that anybody is going to come to the religion of truth. It's for you, okay? I'm not asking for your money like a televangelist. I'm not saying, you know, send, send your bucks to thedeanshow.com. You know, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not asking for your money. I'm not asking for your prayers. I'm not asking, what am I asking for? All right? You weigh the evidence. You decide for yourself. This is about, this is about your life, your righteousness, your hereafter. And that's all, that's all it comes down to. You ready for number one? I'm ready for number one. Can we get a duff roll? <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. Number one. The reason why we should not believe in the Trinity is because when we completely analyze the Bible, there is no evidence to support the Trinity in the first place. None whatsoever. No evidence whatsoever. Now, that's a strong statement. Let me give you some examples. If you go to a Christian and you ask them, what's your primary evidence for the existence of the Trinity? The first thing that they're going to trot out is they're going to say the first epistle of John Chapter 5, verses 7 through 8, where it is said, For there are three who bear witness in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit, and these three are one. And these three are one. Okay? And they will even say it to you that way. Eddie, these three are one. That's how they're going to say it. Well, that's how they say it. How do the scholars say it? The fact of the matter is that the scholars recognize that the first epistle of John chapter 5, verses 7 through 8, is an insertion. It does not exist in any of the ancient manuscripts. It was written into the margin by a scribe who, in the process of copying the manuscripts, wrote it in as a personal insertion. Somebody liked it. They took it from the margin. They transported it into the text. You can't do that. If that's the Word of God, you can't play with the Word of God, then it's not the Word of God. Well, you can play with the Word of God, but it's not going to take you in the right direction. I'm just saying this is what happened. Yeah. Okay? We all know people have played with the Word of God. They've taken out things that they didn't like. They've put in things that they did like. They have manipulated it, fashioned it, molded it to be what they wanted it to be. Everybody out there knows that there are unrighteous people who have grabbed a hold of religion to, to take them closer to their worldly desires. Okay, and this is one primary example of that. The, the, the number one evidence that people hold up as an evidence for the Trinity is 1 John, 1 Epistle of John 5, 7 through 8, okay, and scholars now recognize that that is an insertion. That was added in. That was added in. That's a very bold statement. Now, can you back up what you're saying? You said Christian scholars have also attested to what you're saying. Can you back this up? Sure. And I mean, let me just ask the people out there, you know, who, who is not sick of hearing people say things about religion and they cannot support their assertions? We're all sick of that. So here it comes. The Interpreter's Bible, look up the, look up the first epistle of John 5, 7 through 8. They say these verses are to be rejected. Dr. Schofield, along with eight doctors of divinity in his reference Bible, states that this verse has no manuscript authority and it was inserted. Professor Brooke Metzger states, 
with regard to this passage that the words are spurious and do not belong in the New Testament. Kurt and Barbara, Barbara uh, Alland, um, Bart D. Ehrman, many others have recognized that what is called the Johannine comma, which means these verses, are illegitimate. Now, is it just individuals who recognize it? No. It is ecumenical groups of scholars who have, who have recognized it as well. How do we know that? Because read the new uh, Revised Standard Version of the Bible, read the Revised Standard Version of the Bible, the NIV, the Good News, the New English, the Jerusalem, Darby's, New American Standard Bible, all of these Bibles have removed or modified the passage so it no longer reads these three are one. Go to the most authoritative Bibles of our time, the New Revised Standard Version and the New International Version, and you will find that the first epistle of John, 5, 7 through 8, allegedly supporting the proposed trinity, has been modified or removed. Let, let's uh, hold it right there, and we're going to wrap it up when we come back here on the Dean Show. Hay solo un Dios. Adóralo a él solo y no a su creación. I would go to my room, lock the door, prostrate and cry, saying, God, you know me better than myself. Show me the right way, and I will not look back. I will leave everything behind. Allah is our creator, and he creates everything, and he gives intelligence to people. Rasulullah is Muhammad, peace be upon him. Muhammad is one of the last messengers sent from God. Back here on The Dean Show with Dr. Lawrence Brown. We're giving you facts, not fiction, backed up with evidence after evidence. We're giving the top 10 reasons why Jesus, peace be upon him, he didn't teach the Trinity, nor did any of the prophets. And this is not valid, so we shouldn't believe in it, we shouldn't practice it. And we're going to go on and continue on. You're finishing up, wrapping up number one. Please, go ahead. Okay, number one, what we're talking about is the fact that there is no evidence in the Bible to support the doctrine of the Trinity. Uh, we've just refuted 1 John 5, 7 through 8. The next evidence, if there's any other evidence that anybody holds up, it's Matthew 28, 19. 28, 19 is the verse in which the disciples are commanded to go out and baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. What is the problem with this verse? The problem with this verse is Mark 16, 15. Describes the exact same circumstance, but it bids the disciples to go out and baptize in the name of Jesus Christ. So, which one of these verses are we going to take? Do we recognize that there's a contradiction between the two? Most certainly. How do we resolve that? We look at the example of what the disciples actually did, which was that they went out and they baptized in the name of Jesus. So, we have to either, you know, we have to assume that either they didn't do as they were told, which doesn't make sense, or if they were doing as they were told, the formula to baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit was, uh, was not valid. In any case, even if those words were true, including those three, three entities in, in, one, in one line, does not make them co-equal, co-eternal, consubstantial. Um, moving on, John 14.9. Um, Jesus Christ is quoted as having said, He who has seen me has seen the Father. A lot of people say, oh, that's it. He who has seen me has seen the Father. Saw Jesus Christ, you've seen the Father. What's the problem with that? The problem with that is John 5, 37. Because on John 5, 37, Jesus says, You have neither heard his voice at any time or seen his form. Jesus Christ is standing in front of their faces and telling them with his own words, You have neither heard his voice. And they are hearing his voice. And he's saying, You've neither, neither heard his voice nor seen his form. And they're looking directly at him. Okay? What does that tell you? If he's saying, you're hearing my voice, you're seeing my form, but I'm telling you, you haven't seen God's uh, form and you haven't heard his voice, it's clear that we're not talking about the same entity. Some people jump in and they say, John 10.30. John 10.30, I and the Father are one. Okay? What happens after John 30? After John 30, the Jews accuse Jesus Christ of making himself a God and they prepare to stone him. Does Jesus Christ stand up with the omnipotence of divine authority and say, you heard me right. I said it once and I said it, I'll say it again. No. He goes on to explain to him, to the, to the Jews, that they heard him wrong. And he cites Psalm 82.6. And we also know from Psalm 82.1 
that we find in these psalms that it says that those to whom the scripture has come, the revelation has come, um, shall be called sons of God. And uh, in 82.1, that the judges are actually called gods, not sons of God, but actually called gods. And he points out what we have pointed out before, that this is metaphorical language. And if that doesn't convince you, the last point, I and the Father are one, John 10.30, I and the Father are one, so what? So what is John 17, 11 and John 17, 21, where Jesus Christ talks about how all of the disciples are one and how they are all one in Jesus and God, okay? So it's no longer a trinity. It's Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, uh, God, all of the disciples, all of the believers, all in one. So you can't, you can't have it both ways. You can't accept this metaphorical language as literal in one passage and then not as literal in another. Far, far more credible to recognize that you cannot accept these passages as literal. That was a lot of information. I'm sure you could espouse on this for hours and hours if you condensed it and you made it simple and it's easy to understand. I feel that if someone's sincere, they're open-hearted, you know, open-minded that, you know, this is going to continue to make sense and they're going to continue their quest and hopefully they're going to come to the same realization that you came to and many others, 1.5 billion, that you know, Jesus indeed was a mighty messenger of God and he called people to the oneness of God the same way all the other messengers did, including the last and final message of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. But if those people who are out there who, who want to get more into this topic with you and they want to question some of the things that you have gone over with us today, how can they get a hold of you and also maybe to read some of your books? All of my books are available uh, uh, through Amazon.com, but the first place to start would be my websites, leveltruth.com and eighthscroll.com. That's where people can find you. Yeah, level truth, two words, leveltruth.com. No space in between, no underscore, anything like that. Eighth scroll, also two words, just eighthandscroll.com. If anyone want to have a healthy dialogue with you, that's where you're at. Click the Contact Us button. It comes directly to me. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Dr. My Brown. pleasure. And there you have it. Those are the top ten reasons why Jesus, peace be upon him, Never taught the Trinity. The Trinity is not valid. And this was not a teaching of any of the messengers of God. This is a very important topic because we're all going to die and we're going to have to be, and we're going to be accountable in front of the one God. And he has never, ever, never sanctioned, legislated any of his messengers to teach, preach anything but pure monotheism. And this is what we're calling you to. And this is what Islam calls you to, surrender and to submit to the one God, purely worshiping Him alone and not what He created. And it's interesting to note before we leave that this word Trinity is not in the Bible, but it's in the Quran, the verbatim word of God. And it says, don't say Trinity, it'll be better for you. Your God is one God. Worship Him alone and not His creation. If you like what we had to say, continue to come back here to the Dean Show, we hope that you enjoyed this week's show. We look forward to having you back with us again next time. Until then, peace be unto you. I am not afraid to stand alone. I am not afraid to stand alone. If a lies by my side. I am not afraid to stand alone. I am not afraid to stand alone. If a lies by my side. I am not afraid to stand alone. I am not afraid to stand alone. If a lies by my side, I am not afraid to stand alone.